Alexei's indictment finally arrived, charging him under Article 113 of the Criminal Code of the Russian Federation for causing serious harm to health in a state of effect. As he examined the charges, he realized that the potential punishments included correctional labor, restriction of freedom, compulsory labor, or imprisonment, all for up to two years. It became clear to Alexei that his hopes of being set free were unlikely. A lawyer arrived to visit him and provided an update, saying, The case has been brought to court, but a hearing date has not been set yet. The victims are facing family and job problems. They are struggling to find employment, but Oksana and Olga managed to find jobs. I don't know where Vladimir Ivanovich and Semyon Borisovich, who were discharged from the hospital, are currently staying, but they will be present in court. Curiosity about Nikolai lingered and Alexei asked, and how is Nikolai doing? The lawyer informed him, Nikolai served a 10-day sentence, came back home, kicked out his wife, and filed for divorce. She is now living with your Oksana. A month later, Alexei was escorted to court, looking presentable in a clean suit, clean shirt, without a tie, and clean-shaven face. He was led into the courtroom, where no one was present except for his lawyer. The lawyer positioned himself near the cage where Alexei sat and briefed him once again, emphasizing the importance of not arguing with the court and leaving the defense to him. Just five minutes before the session was scheduled to start, the victims and witnesses were permitted to enter the courtroom. Oksan approached the cage and said, Alexei, I'm sorry. Please let me talk to you. I can't go on without you. Alexei's attention shifted away from her as he noticed Nikolai carrying a bag of food. Nikolai asked the court for permission to feed the defendant, and Alexei greeted his friend warmly. After exchanging brief pleasantries, Alexei explained his daily routine to Nikolai, which involved strict schedules and regular walks in what Alexei referred to as the exercise yard. Their conversation was interrupted by the entrance of the court clerk, who announced the commencement of the court session. Everyone stood up as the judges took their seats, and then they were instructed to sit down. The court went through the standard procedure of checking all the individuals involved in the case, including the victims, accused, and witnesses. Once the witnesses were asked to leave the courtroom, the trial officially began. Over the course of three days, the court questioned various witnesses, victims, and eventually Alexei himself. Following the testimonies, the parties engaged in debates, with the victims playing a minimal role in the proceedings. Finally, it was time for Alexei to give his concluding statement before the court took a break. After the break, the verdict was pronounced. Alexei was sentenced to one and a half years of imprisonment. The court justified this decision by citing the social danger of the crime committed and the evident disregard for societal norms. The verdict did not come as a surprise to Alexei, and he remained calm upon hearing it, especially because his time in the pre-trial detention center would be counted as part of his sentence. After the session ended, his lawyer suggested filing an appeal, but Alexei felt it was unnecessary. He believed the sentence was mostly fair, considering the number of victims involved, and noted that those who were affected shouldn't have provoked the incident. He also remembered that a policeman had been struck, but wasn't counted as a victim, which he found just. The lawyer acknowledged the point, but emphasized that the decision was still up for debate. He reassured Alexei that they would stay in touch, and reiterated that once the sentence became effective, he would be transferred to a correctional facility. Alexei mentioned that his cellmates had already provided him with information about life in the facility. Meanwhile, Nikolai, who had brought a package once again, approached Alexei and handed it to him, explaining it was for the journey, just in case. Alexei informed him that he still had 10 days to file an appeal. Nikolai replied, suggesting that Alexei write to him once he arrived at the facility, as he would be willing to help in any way he could. Alexei agreed and thanked him. Alexei chose not to speak with Oksana and requested the escort to take him to his designated place, expressing his fatigue. He took a final glance around the courtroom before his hands were handcuffed, and he was led to a cell in the convoy room. Nikolai also delivered a bag of groceries to the same location. After the expiration of the appeal period, Alexei was notified to gather his belongings and leave the pre-trial detention center. 
Typically, inmates are not informed of the reasons or destinations for such summons. Without explanation, Alexei was instructed to prepare for departure as a staff member opened the door to the feeding trough. After some time, he was escorted down the corridor and into a special vehicle that took him to a train. There, he was placed in a carriage known as the Stolypin. The journey included a stop at a transit prison before another trip on the Stolypin wagon. Finally, he arrived at the penal colony, which happened to be located in the same region as his previous residence. Upon arrival, Alexei, along with the other incoming convicts, was subjected to a two-week quarantine. During this period, an employee from the special unit inquired about notifying his family of his arrival at the colony. Upon consideration, Alexei requested that his relative Nikolai be informed. Even before his assignment to a specific detachment, authorities sought to gather information about Alexei's background and occupation outside of prison. His expertise as a civil engineer caught the attention of the supervisors. Vasily Fedorovich, the head of the colony, personally reached out to Alexei. As he entered the room, Alexei followed the protocol he had been taught and introduced himself, provided his personal details, the charges against him, and the length of his sentence. He was offered a seat, and during their conversation, Vasily Fedorovich expressed interest in the construction of buildings. They engaged in a lengthy discussion, during which Vasily Fedorovich explained that funding would be allocated for a residential building project. In response, Alexei offered a detailed explanation. To embark on a construction project, there are several important steps to consider. Firstly, you need to have a project in mind. But before you can commence the design process, it is essential to obtain the necessary authorization documentation from the state. This can be a time-consuming procedure. However, there's no need to worry, as I can handle all the documentation required in this area within three days. Once the necessary paperwork is completed, the next step is to develop a feasibility study. This study takes into account the location of the future house, considering factors such as proximity to infrastructure and availability of utilities. These aspects have a significant impact on the overall construction cost. But is that all? Not quite. It is also important to conduct a topographic survey and geological assessments. Now, you may wonder why geology is relevant here. We're not searching for minerals, but rather assessing the fundamental characteristics of the area, such as soil structure and groundwater depth. Based on these findings, suitable building materials and construction methods can be determined. For example, the house might require special foundations like piles or simply sit on compacted soil. So when can the walls be erected? Well, after completing all the previous steps, Architects and designers will come into play. They will craft a building project that takes into account construction regulations, sanitary standards, and climatic considerations. The walls are still a long way off at this stage. First, the zero stage must be completed, comprising underground works such as excavation, foundation construction, basement creation, and installation of load-bearing structures. Only then will the construction progress to erecting the building's outer walls and interfloor slabs. That's a great idea! Once the construction is complete, you will have the freedom to leave. However, in order to do that, you will need to communicate with a lot of people and make decisions regarding matters outside the colony. I have a solution for you. You can ride with my engineer, although he may not be the most knowledgeable when it comes to construction. If any issues arise, feel free to come directly to me. It is important that we make use of the allocated funds for construction. Chief, I apologize for my curiosity, but how exactly did you allocate the funds for construction? What seems to be the problem? You see, without proper design and cost estimates, it is concerning that money is being allocated from the budget. I worry that this may be some sort of scam. Is that what you think? To my knowledge, Budget funds are not given away without careful consideration. I will certainly investigate this matter further. After arriving at the construction site, Alexei and his companions were assigned to different detachments. Alexei, specifically, was placed in a squad focused on construction work. The squad leader briefed him and then guided him to the designated area. The management had decided to utilize an economic approach in constructing a new bathhouse. 
It seemed that Vasily Fedorovich had informed Viktor Viktorovich about Alexei. As he was invited to take a look at the progress of the partially erected, yet unattractive, structure called the bathhouse, Viktor asked, What do you think of our construction site? Alexei responded honestly, Chief, are you serious? The men in the villages build far more presentable and well-built structures than this. Victor dismissed the concern for aesthetics, explaining, Beauty is not the priority. Once the plasterers finish, the uneven walls will be smoothed out with mortar. Are you suggesting something else? Alexei boldly spoke up, I believe we should stop the construction. The already built parts should be carefully demolished, starting with the foundation, and we should begin anew. Puzzled Victor inquired, Why would we do that? Alexei explained his reasoning. Your current construction is showing signs of cracks, and it's likely to collapse or even pose a danger during the construction process. Alarmed, Victor exclaimed, It's going to fall apart. Alexei respectfully replied, Chief, you asked for my opinion, and I provided it. This is why I propose we halt construction. Construction was indeed suspended. A few days later, an expert was brought to the site to assess the situation. The specialist confirmed everything Alexei had previously articulated. Consequently, Alexei was summoned to the head of the colony, where he was informed that from that point onward, he would unofficially serve as the deputy head of construction. His primary responsibilities included overseeing the construction of an apartment building for the colony staff and the development of a new bathhouse. Alexei was known for his reserved nature, never getting too close to anyone and preferring to keep to himself. He had managed to secure a comfortable spot in the barracks, and the busy work during the day helped keep his mind occupied. One evening, after finishing dinner, an unexpected invitation reached Alexei's ears. A neighboring barracks had invited him for a conversation, even though it was strictly forbidden to move between barracks after dark. Curiosity got the best of him, and Alexei decided to take the risk and go. As he entered the neighboring barracks, he was guided to a separate room where a table had been set. Seated at the table was an older gentleman who carefully observed Alexei before gesturing for him to take a seat. The person who had brought Alexei there swiftly disappeared, leaving the two of them alone. Hi, Alexei. Please have a seat and make yourself comfortable. I can offer you a drink, whether it's cognac, vodka, or wine. Thank you, but I haven't had a drink in a while. I'd rather not have one now. I understand. It's always good to make your own choices. On another note, I received a message from someone outside. It's from Vladimir Ivanovich, the person you had an altercation with. He's requesting some closure by having you stay here. Why is he so concerned? Could it be because I didn't tip him enough at the restaurant? Perhaps that might have played a part. However, nobody here is willing to sign up for it. It seems that you might encounter some difficulties once you're back on the outside due to your shorter sentence. The landlord mentioned that I won't be released until I turn over the house. No need to worry. He's actually not a bad person. And thanks to your help enlightening him about the construction site and the budget, his management skills have greatly improved. Someone might even lose their job because of it. By the way, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Andrei Stepanovich. They mentioned me at the detention center. That scoundrel, Vladimir Ivanovich, fooled me into giving him money and then forced me into a certain action. I had no choice. Now I have a lawyer fighting for my release. You've settled in well so far, just avoid any trouble with the wrong people. It's normal to have only men in your barracks. If any trouble arises, don't try to handle it yourself. Just let me know and I'll take care of it. What does Vladimir Ivanovich see himself as? Currently, he sees himself as someone insignificant. However, he has managed to hide some money from his wife, unbeknownst to her. In the past, when I was framed, he moved some money into a joint account as a safety precaution. He also possesses knowledge about the individuals who are monitoring and intimidating us. Does he not fear for his life by threatening to expose them? He has taken some measures to protect himself. He claimed that if anything happens to him, the incriminating evidence will be sent to the prosecutor's office. I believe it is already there. However, he hasn't utilized it yet, as he doesn't want to endanger his source. Why did he want to get rid of you? 
It's because I stole the money, and he cannot access it. Having me around ensures that the money remains safe. But more importantly, I know who his contact is within the district attorney's office. That's what they both fear. Why don't you report them to the authorities? I have two granddaughters who are closely watched by Vladimir Ivanovich. Although they do not know anything, if I take any action, they will be in danger. I don't know how to ensure their safety. Who are your granddaughters? I haven't disclosed their identities to anyone just yet. Nikolai sent a letter with limited information. Vladimir Ivanovich has purchased a small house and started a furniture production venture. He rented a workshop and equipped it with a sawmill for woodcutting. Ksenia Petrovna, his wife, sold her business, the house, and all her belongings before leaving. Semyon Borisovich's wife also left with them. Strangely, her criminal case was dropped effortlessly. Rumors suggest that they have purchased houses abroad and are living there now. Meanwhile, the progress of the multi-story building construction was unprecedented. After carefully selecting the site, conducting all the necessary studies, and commencing the design phase, the head of the colony personally visited the design organization in the regional center. The result of his visit had a significant impact. A month later, he announced that approval had been obtained for the initial stage of the works. The area was securely fenced with barbed wire, towers were erected, and Alexei's team began their work there. With close supervision, the work progressed rapidly. Soon, an excavation was completed, utilities were installed, and a cellar was constructed. Alexei approached the chief, who received him in his office. Citizen chief, we are now in need of skilled masons, and not just anyone. We require specialists. I have already contacted management, and we are expecting specialists to arrive soon. How quickly do you think we can build the house? The chief responded, I am not in a rush. We cannot proceed without a project. Building without a proper plan would mean further violations of building codes, of which we have already committed several, Alexei explained. I understand, the chief acknowledged. The chief kept his promise, and three days later, the first specialized masons arrived along with all the necessary documentation. Alexei felt a wave of relief wash over him as he saw the house gradually taking shape before his eyes. The workers from the colony eagerly searched for apartments, and soon enough, the house was completed. Just two weeks before the new year, the project was successfully handed over, and a week prior to that, the new bathhouse was also commissioned. Alexei's time in the colony was coming to an end. One evening, he bumped into Andrei Stepanovich, and they engaged in a lengthy and detailed conversation. They bid each other farewell, and the following day, Alexei received his papers and left the colony. Taking Andrei Stepanovich's advice, he cautiously assessed whether he was being followed. Alexei dressed in the same suit he had been detained in and exchanged his bag for a small, neat suitcase. He never questioned where he should go. Nikolai had informed him in a letter that he had prepared a room for him. Moreover, they had planned to meet a week before Alexei's release at the facility. During their encounter, Alexei noticed two unassuming men who had also boarded the same train as him. A thought crossed his mind, wondering if he should confront them. However, he quickly dismissed the idea, remembering Andrei Stepanovich's warning about avoiding trouble with the law. Around one o'clock in the morning, the train made a stop at an intermediate station, with only half an hour remaining until the final destination. Alexei stepped out onto the street, and the individuals keeping an eye on him paid little attention as he left without his suitcase. They observed him through the train window as it departed. To their astonishment, they realized that Alexei hadn't re-entered the train, and half an hour later, they discovered his compartment empty, except for a useless rolling suitcase. Alexei went to the station square and entered the waiting car driven by Nikolai, who asked, So, what trouble have you gotten yourself into this time? Alexei responded, It's a long story, but we need to kidnap two lovely girls from this city. Nikolai replied, And hide them in my house. Alexei explained, your house will be checked if they are reported missing. We have a cottage in the countryside that no one knows about. A woman keeps an eye on it. We only have a week to keep them there. They quickly located the correct street and house, entered through the emergency exit, and silently opened the apartment. 
In the bedroom, they carefully woke up the two girls sleeping in separate beds, ensuring they didn't make any noise by covering their mouths. Just before the girls could scream, Alexei said, Andrei Stepanovich sends his regards. Once they were sure the girls understood, they released them. Alexei directed, hurry, gather your belongings, documents, and let's leave. It will soon become dangerous here. One of the girls asked about work, to which Alexei replied, not today. They left the same way they had entered, leaving no trace of their presence in the apartment. Soon, they arrived at a cottage located on the outskirts of town. Carrying the girls' belongings inside, they instructed them, girls, do not venture out into the city, make any calls, or use the internet. It is all for Andrei Stepanovich's safety. If everything goes according to plan, he will join us here soon. Do you think it would be helpful if we introduced ourselves? I can start. My name is Dasha, and this is my sister Varia. Dasha suggested. The other person, however, responded, Girls, it's best if we don't know each other and you should stay away from us. Here's the money Andrei Stepanovich gave you. Please don't interfere. He will arrive soon, and they will provide you with groceries. Alexei and Nikolai left without exchanging any further pleasantries, keeping their identities unknown. Alexei disembarked near the station and went straight to the nearest duty officer. I missed my train and ended up taking an electric train. My suitcase was left in the compartment, Alexei explained to the duty officer. Fortunately, the suitcase was found, and Alexei headed to Nikolai's house. Nikolai pretended that he had just bumped into a friend and immediately called his workplace to take the day off. He quickly set the table while Alexei took a refreshing shower. Afterward, Alexei grabbed his cell phone and dialed Andrei Stepanovich's number. I'm home now, Alexei informed him. Thank you. Andrei Stepanovich replied, concluding the conversation. In turn, Andrei Stepanovich dialed another number, and as soon as it was answered, he confidently stated, We can begin. He then ended the call and crossed himself. Vladimir Ivanovich was roused from his sleep by the shrill ringing of the telephone around 9 in the morning. Yesterday had been filled with meetings, his attempts to establish connections with the right people proving unsuccessful. The meetings had stretched late into the night, leaving him exhausted. Despite his fatigue, he knew he had to make it to the woodworking mill, where he intended to produce building materials from the raw wood. He had recently hired a manager and was busy researching the market. Just as he was preparing to head out, his phone rang. Without looking, he answered the call. On the other end was Pilot, someone Vladimir had hired to handle Alexei, a potential threat. Vladimir had always sensed the danger emanating from Alexei, especially considering his connection to Andrei Stepanovich, who was serving time in the same prison colony. I'm listening, Vladimir said, his voice filled with caution. Vladimir Ivanovich, we lost him, Pilate informed him. How did we lose him? I specifically told you the exact minute when he would leave the colony gates, Vladimir exclaimed, frustration evident in his voice. We tailed him. He boarded the train just as we had planned. We even managed to get into the same carriage. But at the next station, he got off and left the train. He even left his suitcase behind in the compartment, Pilot explained. Vladimir clenched his fist in frustration. Then find him, by any means necessary. But there are only two of us, Pilot replied, sounding unsure. Do you want me to hire an army of detectives? Vladimir said sharply, ending the conversation. He sat down on the edge of his bed, deep in thought. Just as he was contemplating his next move, the phone rang again. This time, it was Lelia, a friend from a neighboring town. He answered the call, saying, I'm listening. Vladimir Ivanovich, Varia and Dasha didn't show up for work. I've been trying to reach them, but they're not answering. I'm on my way to their house now, Lelia informed him. Call me back once you get there. Do you have the keys to their apartment? Vladimir asked. Yes, I do, replied Lilia. Call them. If they don't answer, go inside, Vladimir instructed. Just five minutes later, Lelia called back with distressing news. I entered the apartment. It's empty. They're gone. What should I do? Lilia asked, her voice filled with worry. Go to work, Vladimir replied stoically. 
concealing his own concern. 